Lecture 11, Use of Locks and Reentrancy. In previous courses where we learned about locking uh, and how it all works, we did it and we also did a quick recap uh, of what you need to know about it in this course and I've pointed you at a couple of resources uh, for that and um, that was a basic introduction and the important thing was correctness. So you might have been given some guidance on use of locks, uh, and if you took the course with me, you might have heard me give my speech about critical sections being as big as, uh, or small as they can be, or as big as they need to be and no bigger. Uh, either one of those is a reasonable way to look at it. Um, but there wasn't really much consideration given to that, uh, and broadly it was just sufficient to avoid all the bad stuff, so have no data races, have no deadlocks, have no starvation, um, but that's no longer sufficient. Um, what we need to do now is use these things effectively so that we minimize the impact on performance. There is inevitably some cost to locking, for example, uh, and there's more or less no way to avoid the need for synchronization. Uh, I mean, if, if you don't need it in your program, why do you have it? But on the assumption that your program needs it for some reason, there are costs associated with it, uh, and the goal is just to minimize the impact so that you get the most performance possible. Uh, and so if you wanted to think about that uh, in a slightly less abstract way, uh, we'll go back to what I just said about critical sections should be, well, as, uh, as large as they need to be, but no larger. Uh, so if there's some shared data where uh, we have a critical section, say protected uh, by a mutex, uh, and uh, here we have a series of statements, each statement represented by a little rectangle, uh, and if there is a W in that rectangle, it indicates there's a right to a shared value, and if there's an R, it indicates there's a read. Um, and we want to place our lock and unlock statements uh, such that we encompass all of those things. We want them to surround the writes and reads, but we really don't want anything else to be in there if it doesn't have to be. Uh, and so if we just put a mutex immediately before the um, write that happens here in the first block, then all right, lock is acquired. It's held all the way until the end uh, where we have the uh, last read. Uh, and there are, in the middle there, three more statements which don't operate on shared data, uh, and yet we hold the lock during that time anyway. That is perhaps not optimal. Um, those statements that are in there, um, could we kick them out? Can we get rid of them? Do we need them to be in the critical section? I mean, sometimes the answer to that is going to be yes for whatever reason, even though it's not directly operating on shared data, it has to you know, take place here in, in the middle somehow. Um, that can happen. Um, there might be control flow statements, you know, if this condition is true, go here, um, those kinds of things. But usually we would try to avoid as much as possible having anything in there that isn't directly in operation on critical data. Uh, and most commonly, when you are rewriting your code from sequential to parallel, um, then you have to decide what is shared data and put appropriate locking around it. Uh, and that's most likely how you get in this situation where there are writes and reads, which previously it didn't matter very much where they were in the function, but now it means the time that the lock is held varies significantly. Uh, and maybe we can improve on our performance by moving those things out. Uh, that would be the ideal. Um, if not, short statements, control flow statements, what have you, might end up sort of swept into the critical section, even though they don't, strictly speaking, have to be there, but you prefer to avoid it, uh, and you prefer it not to be the norm. Here's a quick example that we're going to do based on the producer-consumer problem. I will assume you are familiar with the producer-consumer problem from some previous introduction to it. We also talked about it in the concept of uh, how to design your software. Uh, so hopefully this is nothing too strange or foreign to you. Um, in any case, um, what we have is a shared buffer. In this case, I made the buffer size 100. Uh, and we said there are 10,000 items per thread. So each producer is going to produce 10,000 items and each consumer is going to consume 10,000 items. Um, that maybe isn't necessarily the most optimal solution to dealing with this, but let's just assume for the moment that it is adequate for our purpose. Uh, 
uh, and we have a shared buffer, uh, and the shared buffer structure contains, well, the actual buffer that is a vector of the data that is being passed from producer to consumer, okay. Uh, and we also have in there the producer count and the consumer count that is their uh, way of keeping track of what index they're going to produce to uh, next or consume from next. Uh, so that that travels together with the uh, buffer itself, so there's no possibility of confusion. Um, we will then create uh, a couple of semaphores here in main at the start of our program and wrap them in an atomic reference count arc. Uh, so to do that, well, we use the semaphore. Uh, it's included here in Tokyo Sync package. Uh, and permits is our count. In C, we would have given it an initial value, and permits here represents that initial value. So we create it as new uh, and set for spaces, initially buffer size, because at the beginning of time the buffer is empty. Uh, and then also for items, we'll give it an initial value of zero because, well, at the beginning of time there's no items in the buffer, so we expect it to be empty. Straightforward so far and consistent with things we've done previously in producer-consumer problem. We'll initialize the shared buffer. Uh, we'll make it a vector, and I'm going to assign every value to be negative one. Uh, that's just a placeholder sentinel value for the purposes of the example. Uh, we don't really use it for anything, but you could use it uh, as a way if you wanted to print out the state of the buffer at any given moment to find out what spaces are empty. Uh, which is occasionally helpful in debugging. Uh, or alternatively, if you wanted to add a sanity check that says if we try to consume a negative one, it means something went wrong because in, in some way our synchronization is not set up correctly, uh, it would also be good for that. Um, although in this case, it's pretty simple, so we're not going to do too much uh, with that. Uh, and then we will put uh, our buffer inside an atomic reference count to make sure that we can share it between all the different threads as we would expect. Okay, we're going to create a number of producers, in this case, um, four of them, uh, and we will do the same uh, a little further down for consumers. Um, we'll focus on consumers, that's what I put in the notes and the slides, but um, honestly it doesn't matter very much because any improvement that we're going to make is likely to work in both places because this is a symmetric kind of solution. But we create producers, producers do their thing, we create consumers, consumers do their thing, uh, we join all of the threads, uh, and then we print that we are done. Uh, and down below here we have produce item, uh, and produce is just uh, saying, all right, um, generate a random number in this range between 0 and 100,000. Uh, sleep for some amount of time so that it looks like this took longer. Uh, and then uh, print that we produce the item, and then for consume item we will... Uh, sleep a little bit more, again, pretending that this actually somehow takes effort, uh, and then we will say that we have consumed the item, and that's it. Um, so, sure, our uh, produce and consume here are kind of uh, placeholders. Yes, does it matter very much? No. Okay, so let's look at the consumer. So, one question that comes up in Rust that was a little less of a question in C is where does our critical section begin and end? Because in those other languages we had pretty explicit lock and unlock statements, right? There was a pthread mutex lock uh, and then a pointer to the mutex that you wanted to lock. Uh, and then somewhere later on you had pthread mutex unlock which very clearly gave you a uh, direct indication of this is where the lock and unlock statements are. That is less obvious here. I mean, we have a couple of semaphores, and we have a couple. Uh, we have a mutex that wraps our shared buffer, but it's not as obvious what's going on. So anyway, when we look at the loop, so for k in zero from uh, item zero to items per thread, uh, we will acquire a semaphore permit. This is how we decrement a semaphore. So we ask for a permit, and we will put block on items.acquire, because we do want this to be a blocking call. Uh, and if there are presently no permits available, we don't want to proceed. We want to wait. So we put the block on statement there, uh, as we've discussed previously in the asynchronous I.O. topic, that this is necessary for us to wait for the thing that we are expecting. Okay. Okay. 
then um, we will acquire the mutex, actually, by locking it here on the next statement, buffer.lock.unwrap, uh, which is going to acquire the mutex. Uh, and then we will figure out what is our current consume space. We will get buffer consume count. Uh, our next consume space will be uh, current consume plus one modulo buffer length. Uh, the item to consume is we take the item out of the buffer from the current consume space. We assign the next consume space to be uh, the value we've just calculated. Uh, we, well, this is the equivalent of posting on the semaphore, add one permit to the semaphore uh, and then we call permit dot forget what do you mean forget okay so when we acquire a permit from a semaphore in rust by default um, rust is going to uh, see to it that you don't forget uh, afterwards if you're using the semaphore where you decrement it for a bit uh, as you know, some sort of multi uh, plex as, as we would have called it previously um, where you can have you know, five queries in progress at the same time we have something like that this way there's no possibility of forgetting to uh, increment the counter of the semaphore but that's not what we want here uh, if we didn't put the forget statement then actually when we uh, get to the end of this block of code so we get to the curly brace there at the end uh, then permits would automatically be increased on the number of items again uh, which is not correct because that's not what we want. Um, what we actually want is for the number of items to remain one lower than it was before because we did in fact take something out of the buffer. So for that reason we have to call forget. Uh, and forget says that you know, don't automatically uh, increment when we get to the end of this block and the semaphore permit which we acquired earlier gets dropped. Uh, and then, of course, we will consume the item. So, all right, the um, critical section in here begins when we lock the mutex at let mute buff equal uh, buffer.lock.unwrap, uh, and it ends automatically at the end of this uh, statement, or this closure, uh, in that uh, we get to the closing curly brace, and the variable buff that we got goes out of scope, uh, and that unlocks the mutex, so at the end of this iteration of the loop, then it's unlocked. That's kind of late. Um, we don't need it anymore after we have done the last statement involving buff, right? And so we acquire it here. The next statement uh, is, calc is getting the current consume space. That uses buff. It's a read. Uh, next consume space, again, uses it. Uh, and then getting the item to consume also uses it. And then the final statement that we use it is here on line 65, where we set the uh, next consume space uh, so that the count is correct. Uh, and that's it. We don't need it anymore after that. And the following statements, where we add permits and forget a permit and consume the item, they all take place with the lock held, even though that's not necessary and is, in fact, kind of undesirable, uh, especially if consume item takes more time. So, I mean, the, the usual strategy that I always advocate is looking at this closure and figuring out which things access shared variables, and we've done that, uh, and we've already identified three things that we could remove from the critical section. Uh, and um, that's, well... Uh, something that we could relatively easily do. Um, what would we do to make that happen? Okay, there's two approaches for it. One is manual scoping and the other is calling drop. All right, we'll talk about the manual scoping approach first. And like magic, I have switched to the optimized version, which includes the manual scoping. So what do we do? Well, I added the curly braces around the segment that needs to be inside that critical section, all these lines here. However, we need to return the value of to consume outside of this block. Uh, and as we discussed earlier in Rust, the last statement in your uh, in your code uh, in a block will be return its return value. So we can do that, and it sends it back and assigns it up here to to consume. Uh, and then, well, 
when we add permits here uh, and permit forget and all that stuff, it's outside of the critical section because the mutex guard is acquired here on line 64. And when we get to line 70, we know that it is not in scope anymore. Uh, and that is that is a good time for that value to get dropped. And therefore the lock is released and some other thread could acquire that mutex. Uh, in the meantime, of course, we can then carry on with these other statements, which are not involving shared anything in parallel. Uh, in this case, to consume, because it's a 32-bit integer, is going to be copied. Uh, however, uh, for a more complex type, it's just transfer of ownership. The, you know, the ownership transfers from whatever owned it in here uh, to out here, uh, and it would not be super expensive to do, uh, and that would actually work. The other approach, uh, as I say, is to call drop, uh, and that is effective in telling the compiler it's time for this value to die. Uh, and uh, then it, well, what happens when you call drop uh, on the mutex? Uh, if, if we call drop here, um, well, I should do that before to consume because we intend to uh, refer to that. Uh, and uh, sure enough, the compiler tells me that uh, actually that's not what I want. Uh, I should in fact call standard mem drop. Uh, and if we uh, go in and and see what happens, um, this, uh, this explanation is not super uh, helpful. Uh, but basically when we call drop, uh, it is transferring ownership of buff into uh, the drop function. Uh, and well, there it goes out of scope and can be removed, but manual scoping is perfectly good as a solution, so I'm happy with this as it is, uh, and would like it to remain as such. Right, so to recap, it used to be more explicit, so the explicit unlock statement made it a lot clearer where a critical section ends, but now we have to look for the end of an iteration of the loop, or the end of a block, or a similar. Uh, and in the end, when we've made our change and looked it over all the statements, ask yourself the question, do you think you got him? Did we uh, figure out what statements are shared variables and have we ensured that they're all uh, captured within the critical section? Rust is good about checking your homework on this, but we are now more concerned about unnecessary things being in there as opposed to anything that should be in there is not there. Um, and that's something that you know, Rust solves the problem of correctness in this way. Uh, in that it really tries very hard not to let you access memory that is shared without some sort of concurrency control preventing a race condition or similar, uh, but it is not as good at saying, hey, this statement is in a critical section when it doesn't need to be. So that's more of our concern now. Uh, and yeah, in the slides we have our manual scoping, uh, and the other approach, as I said, is to make the mutex guard go out of scope with drop uh, so that it can go away. So I applied a similar change to the producer code uh, that we just discussed about the consumer and that I showed you. Uh, the producer code, like I say, is not identical, but is symmetric uh, to the code we've just seen. Uh, and so it's not too difficult to um, make the change that we want to make. Just put a little block around it so that all the, uh, all the correct statements are inside the manual scoping uh, and everything else is outside of it. Uh, and I created benchmarks as per usual with hyperfine with one warm up run and five runs and using a cargo run release. So the unoptimized version of the program runs in about 2.8 seconds and the optimized version in about 1.1 seconds. So that's itself uh, a nice improvement, uh, you know, certainly. Uh, the amount of improvement will vary with how long it takes to produce and consume items. Uh, if we are consuming items very quickly, then it is less important uh, how, how much time is spent you know, holding this lock, but on principle, you know, every uh, CPU cycle that's wasted is a CPU cycle we could be using for something. So, um, tying that back to the earlier discussion about Amdahl's law, um, everything that happens you know, in a critical section where we have a mutex and we're waiting for and everything, it increases the serial portion of your program uh, and therefore ultimately limits the total amount of benefit from parallelization. Um, keeping the critical section small uh, avoids this and we end up potentially with more benefit from having more uh, parallelization, more CPUs uh, put to work 
helping us out. Uh, but that is not the only reason. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about is that the lock is a resource and contending for that resource is itself somewhat expensive. Um, there are costs to acquiring a lock uh, and there are costs to releasing a lock uh, in terms of execution time, uh, even if we've done everything correctly in terms of what should be in the critical section or not. So that takes us to a discussion about lock and granularity. Uh, and so we have choices about the granularity of locks and there is ultimately a trade-off. Uh, just because, well, hardly anything comes with uh, no, no drawbacks, no trade-offs. Um, and uh, if we consider our options of coarse-grained locking or fine-grained locking, a coarse-grained lock is easier to write and harder to mess up because there are fewer locks that control access to things. Uh, so if there are four uh, items here in this uh, collection, uh, if we have one lock that surrounds the whole collection, uh, it means that when a thread is doing something, it has uh, exclusive uh, rights to interact with all four items, uh, and other threads have to wait. Okay. Um, it does make it a little less likely that you make a mistake because there are fewer locks, so there's no chance that you're thinking about getting the wrong one or um, using using them inappropriately. Uh, but with fine-grained locks, you might divide things up a little bit more, which allows more parallelism, but uh, obviously at the risk uh, of additional complexity and more potential for, say, a deadlock or something like that. Uh, and fine-grained locking is you have more critical sections or more uh, items uh, that are protected by their own mutex uh, and therefore more locks in total. So yeah, coarse grain locking at the extreme, you have one giant lock that's used for you know, absolutely everything. Um, not necessarily optimal because it means unrelated operations have to wait. Uh, in fine grain locking, you have a lot more locks, but you have to be much more concerned about something like deadlocks. Uh, if you were making some, um, some software that operated on users' accounts and you said, okay, there's one lock and you can only modify accounts if you have the one lock, there's no possibility of deadlock in that scenario. Uh, however, it serializes all of your transactions. If you have it set up instead so that every account has its own lock, uh, that allows quite a lot of parallelism, but introduces a significant risk of deadlock in that scenario. Uh, if, say, multiple operations are trying to operate on the same accounts concurrently. So when we talk about granularity, we're talking about how much is contained within that lock or how much is protected by an individual lock. Uh, and our three uh, major concerns when talking about locks are overhead, contention, and deadlocks. We won't talk about uh, race conditions because, as, as we've covered, uh, it is our hope that Rust uh, has eliminated such a possibility. I mean, you can still get it wrong, uh, but nevertheless, we will... Uh, not think about that right now. Okay, so what is the overhead of a lock? I've mentioned already one thing, which is the acquisition and release time, uh, but there are also costs associated with allocating memory for it and initialization and destruction. Uh, how often locks are created or destroyed varies a lot from your program, uh, and how much memory is allocated to them also uh, is, I mean, depends on how many locks you plan to have in your program. Uh, and the costs all scale with the number of locks that you have. So if you have a small number of locks, the overhead for allocated memory of them isn't a big deal. You might need five locks for this program, but you know, that's not a huge amount. It's nothing that you would say is concerning. Uh, but if you have one lock for every account and there are uh, one million accounts, uh, that starts to add up to a significant amount of memory. It's not an unmanageable amount of memory. Uh, in the sense of like, oh no, there's no computer in the world that could possibly contain one million locks. So that's trivial, really, for your computer. Um, however, there is a possibility that uh, there that is a significant chunk of memory, uh, and if you do this a lot, it really starts to matter. Uh, and then there is lock contention, and uh, a lot of the costs, if you will, of having locks is waiting for a lock to become available. A thread that is waiting its turn for a critical section isn't doing anything right now and is therefore not 
doing anything useful. Uh, there are ways to mitigate that, but for the most part, uh, if we are waiting, we are not doing something else. Uh, and you can reduce the amount of waiting by making the critical sections smaller and making the uh, making the locks cover a smaller extent. So uh, again, in the example where we have one giant lock versus lots of little tiny locks, um, the, having the little tiny locks decreases the chance that we are waiting um, at the trade-off of having more cost for memory of the locks and initialization and, and deallocation and what have you of them. Uh, and then of course there is the possibility of deadlock uh, where if we want to uh, transfer money from account A to account B at the same time that money is supposed to be transferred from account B to account A there is a distinct possibility that we end up locking uh, one of the two locks uh, and somebody gets the other one and we end up in a deadlock because everybody's waiting for one another. Uh, and the key condition for deadlock is waiting for a lock that's held by some process or some thread X while uh, holding a lock that is uh, awaited by process X prime. Obviously, if it's yourself, it's not an issue, uh, but X not being equal to X prime is where the problem comes in. Uh, the previous discussion about deadlock uh, talked about things like uh, what are the prerequisites for it. So, you know, um, mutual exclusion, hold and wait, no preemption, that kind of thing. Uh, and had a little discussion about do we live in a world in which deadlock is possible? We know that we live in a world in which deadlock is possible. That's just how our programming environment, how our system is set up. Uh, so we must face that fact. And then the only thing we can really consider is is there a possibility uh, of actually encountering a deadlock in our program? Uh, and that happens when we have a cycle uh, in the resource allocation graph or a cycle in the wait for graph uh, where we have uh, different processes, all of whom are waiting for one another and nobody can make any progress. So that's you know our formal definition. But as I said, the, the three things at the beginning, you know, resource belonging to one process at a time, uh, hold and wait, you can uh, request resources while you're holding on to some, no preemption, nobody can steal resources that you are currently in possession of. Uh, they are conditions necessary for a world in which a deadlock could occur. Uh, and we unfortunately live in that kind of world and a deadlock only happens when a circular wait uh, is encountered. The uh, canonical type example for this in simple pseudocode is if we uh, have thread one get lock one and thread two get lock two. Uh, if this happens uh, in the quotation marks wrong order, uh, where uh, the first statement of thread one runs and then the uh, first statement from thread two runs, we can potentially end up with this deadlock where each of them is waiting for the other. Okay. Uh, nothing super new or exciting there. I hope uh, if you've uh, learned about deadlock previously. So to avoid deadlocks, of course, um, you should be careful when your code acquires a lock when holding one. Again, in previous courses, if you have uh, analyzed some pseudocode saying, all right, is there potential for a deadlock in here? Uh, I would have said that one of the things to watch out for is if you have a wait statement nested within another wait statement, that is acquiring a lock while holding another one. It's not necessarily a problem, but it should be a warning sign that there is a potential for a problem. Uh, and so trying to acquire a lock while in possession of another one uh, should give you a, a little hint that this is something to pay attention to uh, and make sure that it is correct. Um, there are two choices um, when we face this kind of problem. One is we can ensure a consistent ordering in acquiring locks, uh, or number two, we could use try lock. Uh, talk about each of those. Uh, consistent ordering uh, is the idea that locks are always acquired in the same order. Uh, and that is to say that uh, if our rule is L1 happens, uh, happens to be the lock that we acquire first in one thread, then we should ensure that we always acquire L1 first in every other thread. You could choose a different order if you wanted, it doesn't matter. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, you can't necessarily rely on the variable names in the program because they can be different uh, or even the same. Uh, if you have a structure where the, uh, the structure is called account and the account has a lock structure associated with it, it's like, well, it, it doesn't necessarily have a distinct name. 
uh, and therefore you have to choose something else as your strategy for naming it or your strategy for lock acquisition. Uh, something that you might consider if it's uh, account numbers is you could always acquire them in the order of the account numbers because those are you know, unique uh, and uh, although they might not necessarily be sequential, uh, there will be a distinct ordering between them because you can't have two people with the same account number. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't work. So uh, that would help. It would make sure that you have a consistent ordering at all times. Um, alternatively, there's trilock kind of behavior. Um, the pthread uh, trilock behavior um, returns zero, uh, and if not, uh, it doesn't get you blocked. And Rust has something that is very analogous, uh, and that is you call trilock, and it returns a result. Uh, and you check if the result is okay. If the result is okay, then you did actually acquire it. Uh, and uh, if not, then uh, try lock failed. You did not acquire the lock, so you can just go around and try again on the next iteration of the loop. Uh, previously, if you've seen this kind of trilock code where you actually use trilock on both M1 and M2, there's a complicated if-else statement afterwards where like, okay, if you got uh, lock 1 but not lock 2, then you have to unlock lock 1 and then go back and try again. And then, you know, else if you got lock 2 but not lock 1, then go back and try again after unlocking lock 2. And if you didn't get any of them, you can just try again immediately. And if you got both, you can break out of the loop. It's a little simpler in Rust because unlocking uh, happens for any that you did acquire automatically uh, when you get to the end of the loop and try again, which really helps. Uh, and it prevents the hold and wait condition because we don't end up waiting for the second lock, uh, or if you put try lock on both of these on either of them, um, because, well, if we were unsuccessful in acquiring it, we don't get blocked and we have the opportunity to uh, go around the loop again uh, and start again and uh, see to it that we... Uh, give another thread a chance by releasing whatever locks we did acquire, which will prevent the deadlock from occurring. Uh, so in, in a world where there can be only one, we have, you know, this is a, a giant lock and uh, it protects absolutely everything. Uh, and, uh, well, I mean, that, that will work. It is coarse grained locking in the extreme, uh, but is not necessarily uh, something that you want to do because it really serializes your program. Um, but you know, in the extreme where you use exactly one lock, it is, well, very easy to implement uh, and there's no chance of deadlock and has the lowest possible memory usage and setup time. So we'll take it, uh, but it uh, does make your program sequential. And you might be thinking, nobody would do this. This is silly. Why would, why would this happen? And yet, and yet it does. Um, Python puts a lock around the whole interpreter, or at least it did at the time of writing, uh, and it is the global interpreter lock, uh, and it's a reason why a lot of scripting languages have uh, poor parallel performance. We're not trying to kick Python uh, in particular or uh, say that it, it's bad in some way, but you know, as a scripting language, this is a thing. Uh, and uh, any, any program that has this giant interpreter lock uh, scenario is going to end up being hard to parallelize in an effective manner. That doesn't mean you can't have the concept of threads, but threads are only um, really beneficial if one of the other threads is waiting for I.O. in some way. Um, and anything that is not I.O. bound will potentially be slower than the sequential version because there will be a lot of uh, switching back and forth uh, between the different threads, but it's all being executed in uh, sequence anyway. So you're paying a bunch of overhead for creating and uh, working with the threads for not very much, if any, benefit uh, in terms of performance. Uh, this is not totally ridiculous. Um, OS kernels uh, had at least at, at some point a big kernel lock and Linux was one of them. The Mach microkernel uh, did the same as well. Um, and uh, in Linux that, that only really went away in about 2011 with uh, SMP support. Um, as much as it sucks when you see, okay, there's a big kernel lock which is used to protect all the kernel's internal resources and make sure that they're all in a consistent state, that, that really does kind of suck, having it all protected by that and limiting the potential parallelism of it, but correctness is important. Um, I mean, we don't have a class that's called Programming for Correctness, um, 
you might be thinking software testing, but uh, no, if you, if you take the software testing course, you will know that testing does not prove correctness. Uh, it just increases your certainty that there are fewer bugs than there would be otherwise. Um, but correctness is kind of assumed when you're writing your program as a desirable outcome. Uh, you don't want a program that is fast but wrong. At least I don't think you do. Uh, and um, in this in this regard, we have kind of low standards in the world. Um, I, I sometimes uh, hear from students who tell me, well, the program works like 19 times out of 20. Isn't that good enough? Uh, and they are presumably uh, basing that on, well, you know, in the real world, when I use this app, sometimes it crashes or, you know, Windows gets... Uh, some sort of error and I have to reboot it or something like that and you know and then it runs fine afterwards but you know, I don't know that we should accept that uh, and in a lot of problem domains we don't uh, if you went out and you bought a pocket calculator that you were going to you know, use on an exam uh, such that um, such that you could um, you know take it in a in an exam that restricts the kind of calculator that you're allowed you know pink tie approved ones admittedly this seems kind of silly when it's an online term and you can use whatever calculator you want but pretend um then i don't think you would be satisfied with your purchase if it only got it right 98 percent of the time uh, i think you would say that's not okay i need a calculator that gets it right and that would actually be a reasonable position. So correctness is kind of assumed. Uh, when we talk about speeding up our program, we are not saying we want wrong answers. We are saying we want to do as much as is possible while still getting the right answers. Okay. Uh, digression over. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, there is fine-grained locking. And the goal of that, of course, is it maximizes parallelization of your program. Um, but uh, if your program is not very parallel to begin with, there's not a lot of benefit to it. So you end up uh, with a lot of extra setup and cleanup time associated with it for not very much benefit. You know, if you are processing very few transactions, you don't necessarily need to have 500 different locks. Uh, for every kind of small sub-element uh, because you're not doing very much to begin with. Uh, and of course, there is the possibility of a deadlock. Uh, the last item about fine grain locking is generally more error prone. That's a broad statement, not necessarily super applicable to Rust, uh, but certainly the case in something like C or C++ and that you can forget to acquire the lock that you need or you can acquire the wrong one. In Rust, of course, because we package up pretty effectively the mutex with the data that it protects, uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, and this is an opportunity for sort of a reminder that although this course is in Rust uh, and it's the language we use in examples, it's the language used in assignments, and we spend some time talking about Rust as a programming language, it doesn't mean that we have closed our eyes to the existence of other programming languages uh, and that discussions like this uh, about uh, the uh, efficient use of locks will still contain uh, references to and analogies including and information relevant to other programming languages that are not Rust uh, because uh, although Rust may one day uh, take over the world so to speak uh, that hasn't happened yet uh, and there's a distinct possibility that when you leave from this course and go on to whatever is next you will not be writing Rust uh, at that uh, at that time. Okay, um, so databases are a good example of having different kinds of levels of locking. Um, in, in principle, you could lock the whole database if you needed, um, but you could lock fields, so like individual um, data elements. You could lock a record, a row in a table. You could lock a whole table. You could lock a group of tables. Uh, those things are... Uh, up to up to the database server to make a determination about what scope of locking is appropriate for the request that you have made. Uh, if you're only affecting one row in a table, that might be the only thing you need to lock. Uh, if you're changing the structure of a table, you might need to lock the whole table uh, until such time as the structure change is applied. Uh, and there will be different levels, uh, and it's not just all or nothing, uh, where if you viewed it as all or nothing and you said, okay, every data field has its own lock in the database, so you're not going to acquire the lock for every field in every row of every table. Uh, if you need to make some big structural change, there are different levels uh, and use them appropriately.